Um, so I've been here before, and um, because Gilda is one of my favorite people that I've met in five years of traveling, I am here again um, at her request. Uh, I like this community, um, and I have some new thoughts and new ideas that I wanted to share with you. And I really, because many of you have probably heard me speak before, because aside from the Bay Area, somehow Chicago is where most of my talking takes place, especially on the North Shore. Uh, so I'm here a lot. And um, I, I want to start off, I, I just want to get into it. You, those of you who have heard me talk about the price of privilege know that um, affluent communities, this was uh, about five, six years ago that the price of privilege was written, have disproportionately high rates of emotional problems among their children. And um, nobody really knew that research until uh, about 2000, when Sunil Luther, who is at Columbia University, took a look at affluent kids versus the general population. But um, I don't want to go over all of that information again. You can buy the book and read about it if you're interested or talk to somebody who, who, who has read it. Um, I've, it's been five years, and in a sense, I think I've moved on personally from, OK, there's a problem, to what do we do about it? I've spoken at over 200 schools, and in the beginning, there was a lot of pushback. You know, like, no, not at our school. We don't see it. You know, we, we were rushed as kids. What's the difference? I don't get that anywhere anymore. I don't get anybody saying, no, it's all good with the kids. They get nine and a half hours of sleep like they're supposed to. <laughs> they have two hours of homework like they're supposed to. Oh, and the school day starts at 10 o'clock when it's supposed to, right? So th th there is none of that um, because that's not what the communities are like. Uh, and I think at this point, people are really trying very hard to figure out whether or not they can actually make some substantive changes in their communities that make for a healthier environment for their children, but also for their families. Um, I've also realized in the few years of talking that while I'm kind of talking about kids and you've all come to listen to me talk about kids, I'm really talking about you as well. Uh, I'm really talking about the stresses on the family, um, which often fall to the mom. I'm talking about the pace of your life. I'm talking about the competition in your life. I'm talking about the peer pressure in your life, just as I am talking about the kids. Sometimes it's just easier for all of us to hear it in terms of our children rather than in terms of ourselves. But the issues that our kids face very often are the same issues we face. So I'm going to start with my stolen Dimitri Martin cartoon um, about success. What people think it looks like, which is like this, and what it really looks like, which is, you know, like that. So I don't know, we have maybe 200 people here. How many of you went to the right school, went to the private, you know, boarding school or something like that, went to the prestigious college? got your MBA from Georgetown or Harvard, went to work for Goldman Sachs, and was happily ever after. You know, boom, straight up. How many people feel that their trajectory was like that? <laughs> One person. OK, that's, that's, that's about right. And um, my fear always when there's one person is like you're going to walk outside of the auditorium and, you know, like a car. <laughs> really careful, it's just like a, you know, it's like a superstitious thing, the one person who's escaped up till now. Um, so because I'm really bad at math, can some, one out of say 250, what percentage is that? Anybody? Half a percent. Half a percent? Quarter percent? Okay. What do you think the highest number percentage-wise I've gotten in speaking to anywhere from 50 people to 1,000. Um, what do you think the highest percentage of people who have had that trajectory has been? One. It's been 3%. So it's 
So it, it, do, it does get a little bit higher than you think, but not very. Uh, and so at the very best, at least 97% of people who have a very different trajectory um, to 99 point whatever <laughs> you guys are. And I, I, I was thinking about this on the way over, about um, like what exactly do I mean by, you know, the trajectory is sort of backwards and forwards and, and, and like, do I really like the idea of failure? You're going to hear a lot about failure tonight. Um, am I crazy? Because actually, I never wanted my kids to fail at much of anything. So what is this thing with failure? What is this thing with that trajectory being going forward, going backwards, you know, going, thinking you've got it made, falling down again, getting back up again? And it's, it's not really about failure. I'm going to talk about mistakes in a little bit, but it's the process of what's learned in overcoming adversity. So that's about resilience, and that's most of what I'll be talking about tonight. But I, I was just thinking about it like very realistically while I was driving over here, about how that plays out in real life. And the first thing I thought about was my oldest, I have three sons, and my oldest son is 32 and is a lawyer and is about to start his third job. And um, his first job, he worked for a very, very high powered kind of guy um, and worked, I don't know, 14 hours a day. And, and he's not corporate at all. He's, uh, he's plaintiff law and um, ended up in the emergency room in just a state of complete exhaustion. And so left that job and then decided that that was no good to work that way, so he joined um, a law firm of uh, very laid back surfer dudes, <laughs> and um, he's bored out of his mind with that. So now he's on to his third job. And I thought that's not an unusual trajectory for somebody. That, so he started at 26, was trying out different, different sort of environments, different kinds of bosses, different kinds of practices. And if you think about it in your own life, which is what I was doing on the way over. I was thinking about the very first book I wrote, which was written about 15 years ago. It was what ended up being what's called an orphan book, which meant that it never made any money. Um, the editor left, and nothing ever happened to it. And then sort of the trajectory of um, writing more books and more books until I got one that landed, the last one landed on the New York Times bestseller list, and this one did as well. But that this, there was a trajectory, and if you had looked at it somewhere in the middle, you might have said, yeah, not a chance. You just you wrote two books, and they were total failures. What would make you think you could do any better than that? And that's what we're going to be talking about, is how to get kids, when they inevitably run into challenge, to think they can do better than that. Because a lot of, I think, what I see are kids either who are incredibly stressed, very academically talented kids who are incredibly stressed, or kids who have had experiences of really falling down and not doing well and feeling completely marginalized and not getting themselves back up again to try again. So, you know, it's just a, a couple of personal stories of my kid who had fell down, got up, fell down, got up, and myself and apparently everybody else in this audience as well. And there's no reason to think that it's going to be any different for your children, which is the hardest part of this talk, which is your children will run into the exact same challenges, disappointments, losses, even catastrophes that you have run into in your life. And it's a very difficult thing for parents to contemplate. Right? We think a lot of things about our kids. We worry about all kinds of stuff. But we don't really worry about um, the kinds of things I've just mentioned, which, um, again, how, you know, this group of people. So how many people in this group have never had either um, uh, a death, a serious illness, um, a divorce, or a financial reverse? How many people have not had any of those things in their lives? Watch for the car, sir, when you walk out. <laughs> you know, again, we've got one person, two people, I think, actually. That's what your kids will face in life, and it's an unbearable thought, I think, for us, but it is what life is, so our job is to prepare our children for life as we know it. Part of 
the reason that I think that our kids are having so much trouble is because our vision of success is incredibly narrow. I'm trying, this is new for me, so let's see how I do. I am technologically impaired. Okay. Um, we have this narrow vision of success, um, and, it's, and it's highly dependent on metrics, right? For ourselves and our children. So our kids are uh, judged by the grades they get, their GPA, their SAT scores, their acceptance letters. Um, we look at the houses next door, who's driving one car. Um, we spend, I used to say, when I talk about the price of privilege, we spend a lot of time looking good in affluent communities and um, worrying about, you know, Navajo white versus some other white. And, and things that paint colors, they're paint colors. The guy who like has no clue what that all white is, right? Um, so, so we have a lot of kids who manage to look good in spite of having some real problems. And um, I think that as long as we have this incredibly narrow version, we leave out many, many kids who have an awful lot to contribute to us. Um, and Again, if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me speak about my sons, and which is why I got interested in this. Um, so I have three sons, and they're very different from each other. Um, my oldest, the one I talked to you about, so he was, you know, straight A jock, um, went to a good school, became a lawyer. It was like, duh, you know, you just knew, you know, you know, you had that kind of kid, you know what they're doing. Was he really ever stressed by the system? Not especially. And, and I want you to bear that in mind when you hear me talk that there are kids who can navigate through this very narrow, very metric-based system. I just think it's a small minority of kids. Um, and then my middle kid is a very creative kid. Um, and my youngest kid, total hands-on kid, couldn't learn unless he could touch it. And so he did not do particularly well in school. Um, and it seems sort of tragic to me because I really never saw them as being particularly different in intelligence. I saw them as being very different in type of intelligence. And I've been doing these talks long enough, so like when I do a Q&A, the questions I tend to get are something like, um, Dr. Levine, my daughter is taking five AP classes. Do you think that's OK? And it's like, you haven't listened to me at all. Um, but then when I get online, outside, you know, I want to, I want to sign books, uh, it's always like, and I have this other child, right? The child who has more trouble in school, the child who might have a learning deficit, the child who might be on the spectrum, the child who just doesn't do as well in an academic environment, the child with all other kinds of issues. But we tend to keep that secret um, because one of, the, one of the problems, I think, is we become so competitive ourselves that it's very uncomfortable to admit that your child has difficulties. I live in Marin County, and when we used to drop the kids off at school, we'd all go have lattes at the fancy little Woodlands Market, and so there'd be a long line of moms, you know, getting our lattes, and the conversation would be, oh, everything's great, how's your kid, my kid's terrific, you know, you have your perfect SATs, how about your kid, oh, perfect SATs too. Um, where's he go, where's he applying? Oh, you know, the IVs. And it's like, you know what, I'm seeing both of your children and they are both headed to rehab. They are not <laughs> so, so the kids are competitive, but they're also competitive because very often, we fabricate a narrative about how our children are doing when in fact they're not doing that well and we're not paying attention to the kinds of problems that they're having. Um, I just, like I said, I just kind of came in. I came in, I don't know if you saw this in the paper, Piedmont High School, which is in my neck of the woods, just had this huge scandal because they had a uh, fantasy slut league uh, among the athletes. And um, it made international news. So, you know, I get called in. It's like, I always get called in, you know, after the horse is out of the barn. And um, the, the thing about it was this had been going on for over a decade. And don't tell me nobody knew about it. You know, I had kids who played sports. People knew about it. They were just sort of turning a, a blind eye 
until something happens, something gets tape recorded, something something becomes public, and then it has to be dealt with. And I think we would do a lot better if we started dealing with some of the problems, and, and one of them is this issue of who's successful and who's not, before it does so much damage. Um, okay. If we use metrics as our primary way of telling how well our kids are doing, we run into a couple problems. First of all, metrics, so I'm not anti-metrics, I'm not anti-testing, I'm not anti-standards. Um, I always say I'm a Jewish PhD from New York, married to what my family likes to call a real doctor. So um, I, I am not an anti-intellectual by any means. And as a matter of fact, everything I'm talking about is in the service of optimizing um, a child's ability to be engaged with learning, to be interested in the world, to find things that they would like to do. It's not to lower the bar. You know, that is not what this is about. That is not what Challenge Success is about. It's just that we know so much now about what engages students, what is good for mental health, and to ignore it, um, I think it's a tragedy. I really do. And when, when I was driving over, Mike was driving me over, and um, we were talking about the fact that, you know, you can talk about this stuff for years and not do anything about it and see the fallout in school after school after school. And we'll talk about why it's very hard to make change, but I really do believe it is possible to make change. And I think um, we've waited long enough. We have seen enough tragedy in our communities. We have seen enough kids who have eating disorder. And, and all these things are complicated. I'm not laying them all at the foot of um, an overheated metric system in our schools. But every, every measure of adolescent, child and adolescent mental health has deteriorated since we decided that the best way to educate kids is by pressuring them and by um, observing them in ways that are out of line developmentally with how children develop. So, for example, um, the paradigm for this is baby Einstein, right? At one time, every child, every household that had a child, one out of three, a toddler, one out of three had a baby Einstein um, in the home. And the idea was that it would accelerate language acquisition. Um, and, and I use this example a lot because I think, I think it tells the whole story, actually. Um, what, what does research tell us about baby Einstein? Those of you who heard me speak know the answer. Anybody? Right. It, it not only does it not help, it actually retards language acquisition by 10%. And by the way, if you use baby Einstein, like, don't freak out because there's lots of other things that go into language acquisition besides baby Einstein. But it actually retards language acquisition. So here's something which on the surface like makes a lot of sense. You know, what? How, how could that be? I mean, my kid is seeing more words, spending more time with words. But, he, but here's, here's the problem. And it's the problem with so many of these junior kuma, you know, all these things. I did you see in the Times today this new uh, learning, R, learning Rx to make your child smarter, period. Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the problem with it is this. What is, what is the developmental need of a toddler? How does a toddler learn? Um, most of you have high school kids here. How many of you have uh, middle school kids? How many of you have elementary school kids? I feel like I'm in a Catholic school. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so some of you still have young children, so you know how your child learns. That you sit them on your lap, right? And you're, it's like so delicious, and you're hugging, and they're like twirling your hair and your glasses and doing all that kind of stuff, and you're, you're trying to teach them language. Bus, bus, and the check. To compare the affective component, the emotional component of that interaction with 
plop in your kid in the high chair, turn it on the television, you go to the next room and read a book, right? It, it, it is absolutely out of sync with how children learn. Children learn through their senses. This is why when you have to make a decision about preschool, every study has shown that a play-based preschool turns out more engaged learners who do better academically three years down the line than an academic preschool. Why? Why does that make any sense? Because, once again, um, at preschool age, children learn tactily. So if you put them in front of a blackboard and write 2 plus 2 equals 4, there's no movement, there's no tactile involvement. But if you say to them, we're all going to play with blocks, Johnny. Give two blocks to everybody at your table. And he gets up and he gives them and he says, so how many are, how many blocks does that make? That's the way the child starts to learn numeracy. Um, so one of the problems with metrics is it starts way too young in ways that are totally out of sync with how children learn. Um, and and um, in the Atlantic about three months ago, and, and here's my narcissism, I'm really pissed off because usually now I can get what I want printed, but they wrote an article and I wrote a rebuttal that they didn't print it, and I'm mad. So uh, it was called The Data-Driven Parent. I don't know if you saw it, but it was about a new program and new machines that you could bring home the day you brought your child home from the hospital, and it would record absolutely every movement, literally and figuratively, that the child made every time it moved, every time it blinked, every time it touched something, every time it peed, every time it ate, whatever. Short of having a child critically ill, I can't imagine anything good coming from this kind of oversight on your child's every move, right? But the idea of the article ends by saying, this is a way you can debug your child. And all I can think of is it's going to make parents buggy. I mean, you know, now you're comparing how many times your child farts with some other child <laughs> down the road. It's crazy. It's just, it really is crazy. And it has nothing to do with what you want to do with an infant. You don't want to see every time an infant blinks. What you want to see is, is that child following you? Is that child interested in things after a few months? Does it move in certain ways? Does it make eye contact with you? Does it recognize mom's voice? Those are the developed milestones of children. And when we start looking at these other measures that have nothing to do with it, whether it's you know this, these data devices or whether it's baby Einstein, or today's article was it's called Learning Rx, and it's about not raising grades or scores or anything. It's about just making your child smarter. Um, and uh, it's my favorite article in it is like this. Thanks, Mike, for the ride. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. I just changed your brain. Everything we do, every interaction we have, changes our brains. Well, the big the big selling point in this article was that their program changed children's brains. Children's brains are being changed with everything they do in life. And the idea that you can make your child smarter by taking a seven-year-old and sitting them in front of um, some of the exercises or things like picking, picking out you know, the bird that doesn't look like the other bird. It'll make your child a very good bird picker out her, um, but it is not likely to generalize. And that doesn't mean we'll never find things that help with attention, which is really what uh, gets in the way for kids from learning. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean that it's way premature. And as soon as you see the word Einstein or Beethoven or Picasso, or Rx, by the way, this company has no doctors at all in it. It's not run by anybody with any degrees in either medicine or psychology. Skip it. Skip it. Um, because they are marketing and they play to every parent's anxiety that their child isn't being given a leg up. And if your child doesn't have a leg up, how are they going to compete? So we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
Um, okay, so it's developmentally out of sync, measures a very narrow range, and it's easily corrupted by things like I just explained to you. And uh, some of you are probably familiar with Carol Dweck's work, which looks at, you know, she takes two groups of kids and she and they all do a puzzle, and then one group she tells them how incredibly smart they are, and another group she tells them nothing. And who becomes the better puzzle taker? It's the kids who get told nothing. And it's a it's very important research for this reason. The, the concept of self-esteem is probably the most bastardized concept in all psychology, right? Um, when my kids were growing up, self-esteem meant like they got a trophy if they showed up. Literal, literal. Um, you know, it's like you get a gold star if you breathe today. And um, it, the worst thing is to be the coach's trophy, right? Like when they ran out of anything good they could say about the child. You know, most improved, best defense, best offense. When they ran out, they got the coach's trophy, which everybody knew meant that they, there was nothing you could really say about the child. So this notion of, of developing self-esteem by inserting it in a child is totally off base. Self-esteem, in fact, is tied to a huge number of positive outcomes in psychology when it's measured properly. Everything from social to academic to not getting pregnant as a teenager, it's just, it's a good thing to think reasonably and realistically well about yourself. Um, but in order to do that, you have to be good at something. We had it sort of like ass backwards, you know? You have to be good at something, competent, which makes you confident, which then leads to self-esteem. It doesn't work the other way. You don't say you should have such self-esteem because you're so pretty, and then you will feel pretty. It doesn't work that way. You have to feel that way first, and then and then you have self-esteem around that issue. All right. Um, so, and the other thing I think about metrics, the narrow vision of metrics, is it forces parental over-involvement. Right? If you've got one measure that everybody's looking at in your kids, and it happens to be grades, then what parent's not going to be hypervigilant about it? I mean, every grade means something. And so it causes parents to over-parent. What do I mean by over-parenting? Over-parenting has three components. The first one is doing what your child can already do. Um, so your kid knows how to do basic math, and you're still at the table with them, looking at their homework, pointing out the one that they got wrong, you know, telling them to redo it. You're hovering, you know, like a hovercraft over the kid. Um, do me a favor, just once your kid is reasonably confident in something, go, then go read the magazine for 10 minutes. You just bought yourself, whatever, a half hour, an hour of time where you don't have to hover over the child because all that does is make them feel less confident. It's really cool to feel, even if you only got, you know, 90 right out of 100, you got them mostly right, you feel pretty good. You don't have to get the 100 right to feel good about yourself. That's our anxiety that every mistake is somehow fatal to our child's ultimate trajectory. Um, it's a true story, I'll, I'll, I'll just take off for a minute. My son went to a, a Jewish day school his first four years, and he did. You know, this is the high achieving kid, so he did everything perfectly. And the best teacher he ever had, I moved him over to the local public school, and all my kids went to public school from there on out. And the first day, he hands in a composition, it's real, it's really, exactly the way it happened, and this teacher took a big red marking pencil, made an X over his work, and said, now write something else and make a mistake. And that has stayed with me, you know, at the, at, of course my first reaction is, what, he writes perfectly, and then my second reaction was, he was so right, my kid never, at that stage he never took a risk with anything, because he liked being the perfect child. And this teacher was absolutely right, and it had a huge impact on him. Is he still the one who prefers to be perfect? Yes, because a lot of that is genetics and temperament. That doesn't change much. But it was a, a really clear issue from a teacher he admired um, that there were other ways to be successful in the classroom besides getting everything exactly right. So I thought he was an amazing teacher. 
Uh, the other, there are two other aspects to overparenting. The other one is doing what our children can almost do. And I think often this is a harder sell. And it's a harder sell because, well, look, we're parents, so if our kid can't really do it, isn't it our job to help them to do it? Um, yes and no. Um, it's our job to guide, and, and I'm not talking about your two-year-old running into the street or your, uh, you know, 12-year-old smoking bombs all day long. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about what's called the zone of proximal learning, which is right after your kid knows how to do something, how do you know when to let them try the next thing, right? Isn't this is about the toughest part? I can talk about being a mom, of being a mom, right? Like, your kid has just learned to ride a bicycle, and now he wants to go across the street. How do you know? Uh, or then he wants to go around the corner. Or your 14-year-old, who's done a really good job of coming home at curfew, all of a sudden decides you are the worst mother in the world because all of his other friends have an hour later curfew, and he wants a later curfew. How do you know? when he's ready for that extra hour. And while there's no hard and fast rules, and I always say trust your gut and know your child, the way you, you go about making that decision is to look at the last task the child managed. So if your kid can ride to the end of the bike, go into the block on his bike, turn around and come back, do that over and over again, then he's mastered that task, he's probably ready for the next one, which might be to go around the corner. If your 15-year-old always comes home at 10 o'clock and calls if there's a problem and never keeps you waiting, then it's a good guess that you can give her a slightly later curfew. If she can't keep her curfew at 10 o'clock, I can promise you she won't keep her curfew at 11 o'clock. So just kind of as a rule of thumb, how do you decide when your kid's ready for the next thing? You look at how well they manage the task right before that. Um, so what do you do, for example, when your kid leaves his homework on the table and goes to school and it's forgotten homework? On the table? So um, you mentioned challenge success, which we're doing tomorrow night, and, and Denise Pope, who's my co-founder, and I always have a minor disagreement on this particular question. Um, because the, the, the right answer is leave it. Why? Because there is much more to be learned in what we call a successful failure. Can your 10-year-old manage one episode or two episodes or 10 episodes of left-behind homework? Yes, it's within a developmentally appropriate range. It's not cyberbullying. It's not something outside of the range of a 10-year-old. It's something that they can manage. Um, will they? Be, and then there's two things that get learned from it. One is just the practical part of it, which is, how do I not forget my homework, right? So they leave the sticky on the mirror, or they start putting their homework at the door, or what, they come up with something. The other thing that happens, which I think is just as important, is that um, they learn to deal with the unhappy feeling. So from my point of view, one of the things that's very problematic about kids is they don't know how to deal with being unhappy. And if you don't bring it up to them, it leaves them in a state of mild dysphoria or distress. And then they have to, and they're at school, right? So they're not going to cry for the most part. They're not going to go crazy. They're going to have to figure out how to deal with that feeling. And that's a really, really important skill for kids to learn to manage. Now, the place where Denise and I disagree on the answer to this question is she will say you never bring it up to the child. Um, I can't help but think that if I had a really big presentation to give and I had notes and I was doing something very different and my husband saw that I had left the cards on the table and said, you know, I think Madeline needs a successful failure. I'm not <laughs> I would not be happy with him. So I have a slightly softer point of view, which is on occasion, not fair. No, on occasion, if you think it's a big deal, I don't think it's the end of the world. The problem is if it becomes a pattern of uh, bailing your child out and not allowing them the experience of figuring out what they do when they make a mistake. 
Okay. The third part of um, overparenting, which is in many ways psychologically the toughest, is the bleeding boundaries, right? It's the we're going to the University of Chicago, we're going to Princeton. Um, the bumper stickers, and, and I've had bumper stickers on my cars, not because my kids went to such impressive schools, but because I think when there's so little sense of community, there is some community in um, identifying yourself. I'm a UCLA mom. You know, what does that mean? Nothing. But it meant we had a good basketball team, and so it gave me a little bit of a sense of community. But what strikes me about the bumper stickers in my neighborhood is you know, like UCLA is the lowest bar, you know, you can have. Most of them are Brown, Harvard, and Yale. You never, ever see a community college bumper sticker, ever. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm convinced the first one I see that lady gets like $500. I don't know what to do. <laughs> she wins the whole board. Um, and that's, that's back to the competition. And whose competition, who, to, who is it important to? Is it important to the child or is it important to the parent? So, you know, in Teaching Children Well, there's a story about a father and a son sitting in my office. And I know this family, you know, it's a smallish community like yours, and I know a lot of the people. Uh, this father's not nuts, he's a nice guy. His son is really smart, he's definitely headed for a top tier school. And they come in to discuss where the child should go to school, because this has become like a full-time job now for parents to bring in as many resources as humanly possible to help you decide where your child should go to school. Uh, I applied to one school, got in, went. I mean, it's like, it, it, it's like anachronistic, right? But, so they have the school counselor, they have the paid counselor, they have the psychologist, you know, and so that's part of what I do. And the father is sitting very quietly, very respectfully, listening to the kid. He goes to sort of the trinity of, of uh, California schools, which would be Stanford and Cal, UCLA, or Caltech, something like that. And then that's just listening. And then the kid starts more warily making his way across the country. And he finally gets <laughs> to the East Coast, mentioned start and the dad doesn't say anything. And finally, the kid says, and you can feel the tension in the room. Finally, the kid says, well, I, I think maybe I can apply to Harvard. And the dad practically jumps off the couch and says, now there's a school I would give my left testicle to get my job. <laughs> OK, so you can have a PhD and not be prepared to answer that. You know? Now, what's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Right? We want our kids to go to good schools. We want our kids to do the best they can. What's wrong with it is this young boy, who I know because I'm treating him, um, has some other things on his plate, has some things about relationships, um, has all the panoply of issues that I never get called in to discuss, ever. Nobody has ever called me in to discuss um, eye contact among high schoolers. Nobody has ever called me in to discuss uh, changing physiology. No, it's because it's like that, that has left the scene as what matters about this period of time in life, and it's been replaced by a preoccupation with performance. But remember, take yourself back to adolescence. It is, for most people, a very challenging period of life. This kid's got a million things on his plate to worry about. Where he's going to school, what his peers are going to think about it, the girl he likes, you know, the, the erections he gets when he doesn't want them. I mean, a million different things he's worried about. And his father's gonads should not be one of them. <laughs> they just, all they do is tilt his anxiety away from dealing with the issues that he has to deal with. And the issues he has to deal with are really substantial. And if you, when you leave here, if you spend 10, 15 minutes remembering what adolescence was like before it was all about performance, you'll remember that it was not a comfortable <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> period of time. I need some water. <coughs> Thank you.
Okay. So stay away from, or in terms of oral parenting, don't do what your child can already do. Uh, just kind of keep a watchful eye for what they can almost do, but let them struggle. It's interesting. Children like what's called the 50-50 challenge. Um, so that a child will try to do something with a 50% chance of success, which I find just really interesting because I'm kind of like nervous and for me it would have to be like 75%, like 50-50 <laughs> doesn't sound cool enough, like too, too big a risk. But kids go after it, if it's 50-50 they go after it. So let them, let them try new things and, and most of all try not to get in the way of their figuring out what they want to do. Um, don't confuse your needs with theirs. Uh, I, uh, because it's early admissions time, I, I get this call from a mom just before I leave, and she's like beside herself um, about the fact that her son is not applying to the University of Michigan. And she's like crying on the phone. It's not applying to the University Everybody. And anyway, her whole family had gone to the University of Michigan. Um, her, she went, her sisters went, her parents went. And I can't even understand what she's saying because she's crying so hard. So I said, okay, put your son on the phone. And, he's like, and he's like, oh, she's nuts. I don't help her. Please help her. I, I, I have never wanted to go to the University of Michigan. All my friends are going to Wisconsin. That's where I want to go. I'm going to get in. Like, why isn't anybody happy about that? And it was like, it was really like a touching because you can imagine the scene in the house of the mother like being beside herself. And this, you know, a kid, he's a kid, he's 17. He's like, what did I do? Um, has no idea, and he didn't do anything wrong. Um, and, and it's not that mom's nuts. There is something in mom's history about keeping the tradition going, about losing her son, that is driving this kind of hysteria, you know. And this is, this is something I'm working on, but You'll, in the Q&A, tell me what you think. I think that some of our preoccupation with schools has to do with being diverted from loss. Um, that it's much easier to think about endlessly about school desk, school small school, I believe, Christine, than it is to think about what that empty bedroom is going to look like. And um, I think because a lot of us work very hard, um, we tend to put our heart and soul into our children, and the idea of them leaving is really intolerable, and so we divert ourselves with um, what's really what we call the screen memory in psychology. It really isn't the issue, the issue is much deeper, but um, I see a lot of head nodding, so, so maybe that's right. Um, okay. trying to use this and talk. You can see I'm having trouble with it. Um, okay. Okay, so given that, that uh, we have a lousy economy that is very competitive in the global flat world, um, that uh, parents have pressure just like kids have pressure, that we don't have a lot of social support, we don't live down the block from our mothers or our grandmothers anymore, the rabbi who priest doesn't stop on the way home. Um, something I noticed recently, like when my first kid was born, there were all kinds of mom support groups. And so I keep asking in communities, like do you, you may be passive, but do you have just a plain old hangout <laughs> mom support group? Does anybody, like the support group, yeah, one. Okay. Um, when 30 years ago a support group meant the kids just did whatever and the moms got together and talked about, you know, is my kid doing this or that or whatever. Every support group I know of now in my own county is around a problem or an issue. So we have lots of spectrum, you know, autism support groups. We have uh, lots of dyslexia support groups, but they're always around the kids problems and they no longer function as a safety net for normal mother's concerns. So my husband does a lot of third world medicine and we go down to Guatemala and down there 
you know, poor as dirt, but every morning, all the moms are out at the river washing the clothes, just like talking to each other about what their kid did or didn't do or how they should raise them. And I don't, I don't think we have that kind of support anymore. And I think it's part of the reason why we put all our eggs in one basket. You know, friends are really a very mobile society. Uh, technology, I think, has had some wonderful components to it, but I think it has fed into a sense of isolation for a lot of people. Um, and I think that, you know, women in my community say their husbands work all the time down by Silicon Valley. It's all run by men. It's all the young Turks. And one, one mom said to me, you know, my husband's in Washington, the president, and I'm home changing diapers. So there is a sense of sort of uh, being removed, being isolated, um, that I think makes us invest a great deal in our children. And of course, parents always invest in their children, but they've invested in different ways. So, for example, that, uh, this, is, um, this is considered the Midwest, right? Yes. Um, so I can say, uh, when I'm talking to an old high school audience, that I, that I don't like AP classes. And the reason I don't like AP classes is because it feels to me that children are never allowed to be at the stage they're at, right? So the toddler is in an academic preschool learning, I don't know why. Um, and, and then, you know, the kid in elementary school is prepping for his high school interview. And then the kid in high school is taking college courses. I mean, why isn't he taking college courses in college? Uh, like by definition. So, Children never get to sort of rest at the developmental stage they belong in. And as a result of that, and I think this is really important, the, the task, growing up, takes a foundation, right? You don't just grow up by skipping over the things you need to do. So, let me give you an example. Um, if, if, if you're three, four, something like that, and you're in a sandbox with your best friend, and you take the, and he's got your favorite pail, and you take the shovel and you bang him over the head. A not unusual interaction among small children. Um, the job of young children, to some degree, it's a lifetime job because I just ate a pound of candy before I came here, um, <laughs> is self control. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they left it's Halloween, right? They left like a thing of candy for me. And not only could I not control myself, but everything in it was different. So it had a lot of variety. So it was Snickers and Twix and Dots. And, you know, so like you ate one, and, and if it was all the same candy, you would say, oh, I can't eat four Snickers bars. But because they were all different, it felt like I just had one of those and one of them. Um, <laughs> So back to the child, right? So I, this is what I mean when I say, you know, all these issues are our own issues too. Um, the child has to learn self-control. Why? Because his next stage of development will be in school where he can't hit the person next to him over the head anymore with a shovel. So that's why playing in a sandbox is, is the learning that needs to take place. And it goes on. It, it's sort of like, um, What's the job of children, uh, elementary school age children? Um, their job is to try out a whole bunch of different things because it's the only time in their life that they're really free to figure out what interests them, what they're good at, what their skills are. Um, adolescence is about identity, um, and then young adulthood is about intimacy and forming relationships going on, having them with your own partner and your own kids. So you can't keep, we can't keep having kids skip these basic developmental stages and think we're going to end up with a robust kid. This is what we end up with instead. We end up with, this is a story told to me by the dean of freshmen at Stanford. Right? So this is Stanford, the pinnacle of West Coast achievement. And it's early in the semester and she's forgotten where her next class is. And instead of reaching into her backpack, to find her schedule, she reaches into her pocket, pulls out her cell phone, and calls her mother. 
16 time zones away in Asia. Now, as a single example, it's like, so what? But if you spin that out in terms of what can I do for myself and where does help come from? Is it in me? Is it internal? Is it, um, am I an internally motivated kid? Or do I depend always on external factors to motivate me? This is like the mom who comes to my office very proudly and says, look, look what my daughter just sent me. And it's a cell phone picture with three different pairs of shoes on it. And she said, no, really. And she says, she can't pick out shoes without me. And mom sees this as a measure of their connection. What it is a measure of is her child's social retardation, really, that she can't do what a 19-year-old or 20-year-old child should be able to do, which is to have the vaguest sense of how to dress herself, right? Um, so I think if we keep sort of jumping over the skills that kids need by pushing them too quickly into the next stage, they miss the scaffolding that's necessary to do increasingly difficult things well. Um, and I think that's very important, and I think it's very neglected. Um, and I think also, by the way, that it has a lot to do with uh, the very high dropout rates from college. Um, only about 60% of kids who start college finish it. which is one of the lowest rates in the Western world. And I think that that has a lot to do with um, the fact that kids are missing a whole bunch of other skills. These are the kids who want to take a year off, uh, a gap year, which for the right kid is a really good idea. Um, or the kid who just, you know, is having anxiety problems. These kids haven't learned how to cope. If you intercede, if you um, always provide the answer for your child, you deprive them of the opportunity to learn coping skills. And so if you don't have coping skills, what are you supposed to do when you hit those bumps? And again, it's back to this harsh reality, which is we're not always going to be here for our kids. And you know, when your kids are young, you don't have to think about that. But when you get older, you do think about it. And it, it, it doesn't matter how old you are. That's the reality of life. And so if, if a child doesn't know how to self suit doesn't know how, what to do when they're upset. Um, somebody said to me, I can't stand to see my child unhappy. And I know this feeling well, because none of us can stand to see their children unhappy. Um, but if you can't stand to see your child unhappy, you're in the wrong business. Um, and the, re the reason you're in the wrong business is because growing up, of necessity entails learning how to deal with disappointment and loss like that. So if your child doesn't learn how to do that, go for a walk, meditate, read, talk to a friend, um, play the piano, uh, figure out what he did wrong, figure out what the other person did wrong. Um, whatever it is that, that sort of creativity, go, you know, draw, write, whatever. Um, when they get hit with those things in college and you're not standing by, um, it makes them incredibly vulnerable to substance abuse. It makes them incredibly vulnerable to making poor choices. And, um, you know, suicide always comes up because suicide has increased among 10 to 14 year olds by 78% and um, among the next group of adolescents by 38%. And the reasons for suicide are incredibly complicated and, and I can never be laid at the door of any one thing. But unless kids have repeated opportunities to develop coping skills, to develop an internal place that feels robust and reliable and consistent to go to when they feel in trouble, then they're extremely vulnerable to poor choices and they're extremely vulnerable to peer pressure. And if you think a 16-year-old or a 15-year-old has bad judgment, think about five 16-year-olds, right? They have worse judgment. Put them in a group, they have worse judgment. I would say like a 13-year-old's judgment is like a Ferrari without brakes. You know, it's all impulse 
And, and it's actually got some cognitive ability, but it has no brakes. It has no way of dealing with risk yet. Um, so we need to allow our kids to have these kinds of experiences. Um, and we need to tolerate it. And so much of it has to do with our ability to tolerate their unhappiness. Um, so the, you know, the thing I always use for this is your, your, if your kid learns how to walk, right, she takes a few steps, she falls down, she looks right at you, are you freaking out, hopefully you're not, you say, come on, get up again. I was just with a whole bunch of babies and I was watching them, it was, it's so fun because they plop down and after they've looked at mom once or twice, it's a grand adventure, you know, they take a couple steps, they fall down, they take a couple steps, they fall down. And nobody would ever say to that toddler, you fall down one more time, you're going to burn for the rest of your life. <laughs> no. no, we like so totally get that it's in the process of all those failures and our ability to tolerate it, to tolerate it. Because if we couldn't tolerate that, and of course most of us can tolerate a falling toddler, but if we couldn't, and we ran and every time picked the kid up, they'd never learn how to walk. And, and that's sort of the metaphor that I keep in mind about um, the need to have children fall down, learn from their mistakes, not because I'm a failure, but, I, but because I think there's a whole process that takes place when kids learn how to cope with getting better at something, with learning something. I had polio as a child. And I was like the last person in the country to have polio. I had it in August, and the vaccine came out in September. And um, it was not a, it was a horrible experience. And um, so when my kids go for their polio shot when they were little, like I was like, yes. And you know, does it hurt for a moment? Do they cry? For, of course they do. But it felt like I understood in such a profound way that even though this hurt them for a moment. Um, it was such a blessing for them to be able to be protected in this way. And, and I suggest that you maybe think about some of the bumps that kids hit along the way similarly. That, no, we don't like to see them cry, no, we don't like to see them hurt, you know, the, the boyfriend breaks up with them on, uh, on Facebook, you know, all these horrible things that happen to kids in one form or another. But those, that space, and I, I, I never know what to call that space, you know, Here's what kids can do easily and you feel comfortable, right? And here's what you would, you know, put yourself in front of a bus that, so to protect them from. But there's this big space in the middle where they're struggling, where they're trying, where they're crafting a sense of self, and it changes all the time. You know, one day your kid is like a god who's got black stuff on her nails, and, and, and then the next day, you know, she's a nun, and then, I mean, it's a sudden, changes in identity that are so hard for us to tolerate but are absolutely necessary if our kids are going to grow and you know at, at the end of the day the research is your kids will be more like you than different from you so take some heart from that even when they're wearing black lipstick um, okay Um, I think the other thing that we're nervous about is that our kids will not be able to compete and that they'll be left, you know, sleeping in the basement or on the uh, couch playing video games and eating Doritos for the rest of their lives. Um, and, you know, should we be working? I just sent three boys out into the work world, so two out of three. Um, Yes, there are things to worry about, but I would argue that the way we're, we're preparing kids is completely out of line with what every business leader tells us the kids need. So creativity, collaboration, um, social skills, uh, flexibility. I was just on a panel with the head engineer of NASA, and I had a great talk with him because I asked the question that like you never get to ask, which was, you know, how are American kids doing? You know, I see you bringing, you know, he showed me like his, his team. I see you bringing in all these kids from Asia and from India and what, like, what's going on with our kids? And his answer was really interesting. He said, our kids are just as well trained as any, any group of kids. 
but their social skills are not, and their work ethic is not, and they don't have the grit that other kids have, and their sense of entitlement is absolutely suffocating. And, and then he gives examples of kids coming in and saying, hey, it's five o'clock, time to go home, um, and the project's not done. Or, I've been here for three months, uh, when do I get a raise? Um, or, what my favorite is, what do you mean I get evaluated once a year? I need you to tell me every day how I'm doing. <laughs> you know, kids who have always been told how incredibly special they are need this sort of constant feedback, extrinsic, right? Because they don't have the internal ability to evaluate themselves. Um, and no business, business which has to be lean and mean now, no business has the resources to tell your kid every day how special they are. So um, uh, sometimes I think about this in a certain way, which is um, I think adults keep a secret from children. And, and the secret that I think we keep has to do with the fact that in real life, you have to be really good at one or two things. And if you seriously inventory yourself, um, you will find that you're incredibly at most things, i.e. average. Um, now, now, see, it's dead silent, right? Like everybody, yeah, maybe over there, but no, my kids do <laughs> um, That, but she must be talking about another school district. Um, I'm, this is so comfortable for me, I can't tell you. I love it, I can't wait to have the Q&A because then I hear what you think. Um, I like to write. Um, I'm really good at writing and speaking, and I think I was a really good mom. Um, I'm terrible at anything visual, spatial, and um, if you ask people at Nutrier, where I kept an entire audience waiting, they sent me to the bathroom down the hall and found me in the boiler room about 20 minutes later. Um, I'm terrible at that, and I'm terrible at quite a few other things, and most everything else, I'm average at. I'm an average driver, cook, a million things. And this idea that kids should be straight-A students, uh, perfect boards, like, that's not real life. I called a friend of mine uh, just before I came here because he always has interesting facts. He was the uh, founder, CEO of an organization called Nine Pass, the biggest leadership development company in the world, I think, certainly in the country. And he sold it now, and he's building schools because he's got a lot of money. And I said, he always sends me these big IBM studies on um, what management is looking for, and um, so I told him that I was going to be talking, and I was sort of interested in how many things he thought he was really good at, because, um, you know, he's got a great family, and he's got a bazillion dollars, and everything looks great, which I know means nothing, but, you know, I figured I'd give it a shot. And he said, he, said, he pulled out his research, um, and he said that the research is, right in line with sort of my psychological intuition, that you have to be really good at two things. In order to, if, if you're interested in corporate America, in order to rise. So for example, you might be really good at finance. You might have a really good finance brain, but if you didn't have interpersonal skills, you were going to be an upper cruncher. If you were really good at finance and you had really good interpersonal skills, you could be a CFO. The research is that people who rise in, in organizations need two and sometimes three things to be outstanding at. Not hundreds, not everything, a couple of things. And I gotta tell you that from having raised three children, I think we spend way too much time worrying about our children's deficits and not nearly enough time cultivating their strengths. Because at the end of the day, it's their strengths that they will play to when they go out and grow. I'm a baseball, a baseball fan. That's because the Giants just won. I'm a basketball fan. So it's like, in real life, we go to our right, right? I can't find my way out of the bathroom, so I don't become a surgeon like my husband. Um, my husband wouldn't know how to tell a joke, so he became a surgeon. I mean, we just sort of, we do what we're good at in life. And I think kids look at their parents see them as being incredibly successful. I have a real interest in identity issues with kids um, from 
very high performing families. And identity is an enormous issue for them because either they're in direct competition, usually with dad who, you know, was a very powerful figure, or they say they pull their cards and refuse to play, right? They find it very hard, one of the one of best known uh, people down in Silicon Valley, his two kids are at Stanford under assumed identities, not for security, but because they don't want anybody to know who they are, because at the very point in life when you're working on, like I said, intimacy and identity, it, they feel that that gets pushed aside as soon as people know who they are. So I think it's really important that we give kids a space of their own, that we value their particular interests. Um, I always think back to, my oldest son was a really good athlete, and uh, there was this kid on the team, Tony, and Tony was the kid who would you know, wander off in the middle of the game because he found a plant that was interesting. And everybody thought Tony was like so weird, like, you know, what is he going to do? Well, he's, you know, he's the chair of botany at a major university. So th there's really no interest that can't be cultivated into a lifelong, I don't, I don't like the word passion, please try and get rid of the word passion, especially if you've got young kids, because if I get one more phone call, Dr. Levine, I'm really worried about my kid, he just doesn't have the passion. How old is he? Six. <laughs> okay. Six-year-old, their passion is life. I feel like passion has become just one more thing to make you anxious. Does your child have a passion? Really? Why not? Maybe you should send them to chess camp. Maybe you should send them to soccer camp. Maybe you should cultivate a passion. It's enough for children to have an interest in things. And, you know, maybe it'll develop into a passion. Maybe it'll stay an interest. But it feels to me like one more thing that parents are worried about. We worry about the kid who has no interest. That tends to be a depressed kid. But, you know, there's a big piece of temperament in what looks like a passion. So, um, I'm mean, just thinking of my own kids, my older kid, who you've heard a lot about, you know, the president of the fraternity, but outgoing and all that kind of stuff. He shows his enthusiasm one way. My nonverbal, hands-on kid, you know, would never look like he, like my older kid in terms of passion. He's got a different temperament. He's what's called slow to warm up. He's a quiet kid. That's not going to change. And your child, really, is to get to know your child well enough to know how they express their interests, how they express their passion, who they are, and what they're likely to turn to as sources of comfort and as sources of interest for themselves. Um, you know, if you plant an acorn, you're going to get an oak tree. You're not going to get a willow. You're not going to get a birch. You're not going to get anything else. So we really have to know the child in front of us. We have to love the child in front of us. And while our kids are all incredibly special, and, and you know, I mean, I adore kids. I've spent my whole career working with teenagers, which some people find astounding, but I really love. Um, they are incredibly special in the fact that they're unique and they're ours and they're a gift, but they're not all incredibly special in the way that we've defined specialness, which is how well can you perform. Um, there are two most common lines I hear in my office as a clinician. One is, can you help my mother get a hobby besides me? <laughs> And the other one is, I'm only as good as my last performance, which is a, an incredibly painful statement, which means my parents are really happy with me when I score a goal, when I win the game, when I get the A, and they're disappointed in me when I don't. Um, and so here, here, you know, here's a bit of wisdom from getting older. Nothing you do matters as much as maintaining a relationship with your child. Nothing. Whether they go to bed at 10 o'clock or at 3 in the morning. Whether you let them stay out till 10 uh, or, or don't have a curfew. Nothing matters as much as maintaining a relationship with your child. Now that doesn't mean you're always happy. That doesn't mean you don't fight with each other. But it does mean that you don't rupture the relationship by refusing to see the child you've been given. Um, my middle son, I told you, is, uh, is 
artistic. And, um, and, and who's that hard for? Who's, who has trouble with a creative job? My husband. I do. The mother, the mother. Why? Because where is he this week? You know, oh, my son is at Yale this week. He's directing the show. He's going to be there for the next three months. He happened to be at Yale. Go see the drowsy shower. Good month, right? And where was he two months ago? He was handing out flyers in Times Square for Banana Republic, which is what <laughs> the creative life looks like for, you know, 20 something. That's what it looks like. And so I do my damnedest to support him. This kid's been on a stage since he was five. He's, he loves the theater. Um, but do I ever get anxious? Yes. I mean, you know, sometimes you can know things up here, but it's hard to feel them in your heart. And so I was back in New York with him during one of his, you know, sort of unemployed periods. And I said, so Michael, you know, you love theater so much. Have you ever thought about the business side of theater? <laughs> and he said, you're the woman who goes around the country saying, see the child in front of you? <laughs> I'm going to know what you in town. I'm going to rack you out. You know, so, you know, we all get nervous about our kids. And that's, that's okay. But, but we try hard. You know, I did that once. If I did that every time I saw him, he would not want to see me. Um, and that would rupture the relationship because the essence of who he is lies in his creativity. And I'll never turn him into a CPA for a theater or anything like that. And I shouldn't try. And your kids will let you know for the most part when you're like, just like he let me know, way off track, huh? You know, no. Um, listen to your kids when they do that. The last thing I want to talk about is um, we don't just want smart kids, we want thoughtful kids. Uh, I feel this country is suffering from smart people who aren't thoughtful. And when we think about what we want for our kids, which I've been, you know, obviously doing for a very long time, um, I think most of us really know that we want our kids to be good people, that we want our kids to um, feel connected in the world, to be good parents, a tad sense of mission to understand the value of service and that no matter how smart they are or what school they go to, if all you want to be is the CEO uh, and you want to know the best return on investment for your child, I can tell you that. We know what that is. That's to send your child either to um, one of the top engineering schools like MIT or Caltech or to send them to an Ivy League or equally prestigious school and have them go into engineering. If that's all you want to know is ROI, that's your best investment. However, the, the percentage of kids for whom that's a match is very, very small. You know, it's bad to think about being average. Most kids don't belong in engineering. Most kids don't belong in Caltech. And, you know, you have to give equal grace and appreciation to all the other things that kids might be interested in. And I think because we've been so preoccupied with academics, we have neglected all the other things, good decisions, integrity, be a good citizen, kind to you when you age. You turn out an entitled, selfish, narcissistic child, you will end up in a nursing home. <laughs> so, so if you think of it no other way, Think of it in terms of the kind of child you're hoping to have when you turn 60 or 70 or 80, right? The qualities of character and honesty and compassion that we want our children to have. And if all we do when a child comes home from school is say, how would you do on that math test today? If that's all we're ever asking, there's 24 hours in the day, and especially with teenagers, there's maybe four questions that you're allowed on a good day. If they're all spent, if you spend all your currency on academic performance, then you're leaving out what I would consider to be the equally important, if not more important part of raising a child, which is not the CEO model, but the 20 year down the road model. Whatever your age is, 45, 50, think about 70. That's when you want, that's, 
that's the child you're looking towards, the person he becomes or she becomes down the road, not at the end of the semester. Um, and I think we make a big mistake in putting all our energy into, like, you know, I said, nobody ever has me come talk about character, ever, ever. I once was supposed to give a talk in Marin County on the average child, and I had an audience of zero people show up because apparently there is not a single average child in all of Marin County. Um, so I think we need to be much more realistic about our kids. I think we need to remember that they have a developmental arc that needs to be attended to. And what I'd like, I'm going to stop in a second, what I'd like to discuss with you as a group, if, if you're amenable, is look, I think a lot of people get that this is a better way to raise kids than to be pounding them about their grades and stuff like that. But it's very hard to change the community. And it's very hard to change the culture. And um, I think it takes a tremendous act of courage to do that. Um, and it can't be done alone. And it needs to be systemic. And I think people come up against all kinds of problems in trying, you know, all I can say to you, Nine hours and 15 minutes. Your child's supposed to sleep nine hours and 15 minutes for optimal brain development. And I, I don't even have to ask you to raise your hand. I know how many kids get that, and it's it's a tiny, tiny group. So how do you make things like that actually happen in the community? Um, so I'm going to stop with a question, I guess. And um, thank you for your attention, and I'm going to open it up for Q and A. And here comes Gilda. <laughs> okay. Is it on Gilda? It's not on Gilda. Um, I just want to mention that um, you talked about Carol Dweck, and Carol Dweck is coming, I believe, May 8th. She's check, our May check. speaker here at Glenbard check. West. Brown. So, um, Do you hear me? And, you should, and you should listen Just to her down. because her work is yeah. truly revolutionary in terms of how to keep kids engaged with learning. I also just wanted to mention, I think we're sold out of books, Gilda. And if you give your name to, oh, you have one? Okay. Testing one, two. Uh, if you give your name to the gal who's selling books, she, she can help you with that. But all right, let's go to your name. Question. Yes, right here. We'll stand up. What is your opinion on, on same-sex education? What is your opinion on same-sex education? Same-sex? All boys school, all girls. I wasn't sure if you said same sex or safe sex. <laughs> <laughs> My opinion on safe sex is it's really good. <laughs> same sex education. There is some indication that same sex education for girls in particular um, is good for them in terms of a uh, sense of self. So I'm not sure that I ever really considered it because I think the world is made of girls and boys, so that's why I have my kids in the regular school. But I, but there is definitely evidence that for girls, in terms of self-esteem and, and finding their what Carol Gilligan calls boys, that there are advantages to um, single-sex education. What do you think of uh, the idea of evaluating uh, teachers and schools on the basis of how well students do on tests, test scores. You're asking me that in Chicago, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, I was a teacher uh, first in South Bronx of New York for several years. Um, I, I do think there should be measurements. Um, I don't think that you measure teachers by how their students do. Um, and, and the reason for that is I think the factors that go into it are so complicated that I'm not sure that that could ever be done well. Um, I might feel differently if somebody showed me a way to do that that took into, you know, that's an incredibly different, difficult experimental design to see given how different uh, the classrooms are and the stories are and the home life is. I think it would be incredibly different. So, you know, I, I know it's a huge issue in in uh, Chicago, um, and I don't know what I don't know what most people in the city feel about it. Maybe you could tell me. 
Say again? I can't speak to it. I'm not that knowledgeable about it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, you know, from what I know, the experimental design is really, really difficult. The idea that people should have, just like kids, you know, when I do a talk like this, it's not that kids don't have to learn content. They absolutely, it's a given. Like, before I start talking, and I should probably say that, it's a given that kids have to learn content. So if you have a teacher and nobody's learning any content, that's not a good idea. Um, you know, my kids had that teacher who sat in the back, all three of them sat in the back with the newspaper every day and had the kids read the book um, in, in any other, you know, in any other uh, profession. That person wouldn't have a job, but he didn't teach it, so he shouldn't have. Um, the, the, this is about, so I do think there are standards for teachers. Exactly how to measure that, I don't know.
that I was going to bring up as well. My question is, it seems to go contrary to the intelligence that you think may come with affluency, which you're exposed to better school districts. What has changed? How do we change this when there are so many studies out there that show the benefits of charter schools, the benefits there are schools out there in Finland who have model examples of hiring the best teachers. If you place the minimum level of teachers to get master's degree and those teachers are um, placed in poverty stricken areas as well as affluent areas, everyone is on the same playing field. There's so many studies to show that that will increase our education system tremendously. And I don't understand with all the research out there and all the studies out there, why this change has taken so long to reverse it. So why has changed? I, I missed the very first sentence of what you said, so I don't know if that was. Well, it's just coming off of her. her oh, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, it's pretty frustrating, isn't it? Um, charter schools as a whole don't do much better than public schools as a whole. Individual charter schools do much better, so it, it sort of depends. Finland, which of course has become the world's exemplar right now for education, and people say, well, you can't compare Finland, it's a small homogenous country. Um, but so they, so what they did was they started comparing it to small homogenous states in the United States, um, and they still look great. But it, it, it's an entirely different culture. It's a culture that believes in equality. Um, it's not based on competition. And so the work is project-based, which is one of the things we try to get the schools to do and, uh, that, that are child success schools. Um, the teachers are not especially well paid, but they enjoy tremendous status there. They're at the top of their class. It's very, it's very hard to be a teacher. They have higher levels of status than even physicians do. Um, it's a different culture, and we're, for whatever reason, this is a, a country about competition and misplaced competition. You know, it's like the old Horatio Alger stories, you know, everybody's going to do better, but the, if you look at the Horatio Alger stories, they were not about winning. They were about becoming a good citizen, a good and independent and contributing citizen. And um, I think we need to go back to that story of a community where everybody has some responsibility, but it is not where this, I mean, look at what's going on in this country right now. I mean, my youngest son came home after the Lance Armstrong story broke, really beside himself. My youngest kid's 20, and he just said, I give up, you know, you can't trust anybody. And I think these kids are grow have grown up with um, the most horrendous manipulation of people you know, I never say ever because my husband always points out that history is filled with horrendous manipulations. But, you know, I think you follow the money. I think that, um, uh, you know, these tutoring services like this uh, Learning Rx, it's $12,000 uh, for the program. I mean, these are enormous industries and the, the, S the, the college board, which used to just administer the SAT, is now a multi-billion dollar industry because it has tutors and courses and all kinds of stuff. I think it's become an industry, and I think that somehow, for reasons that are not entirely clear, and I think have to do with isolation, frankly, um, we have allowed this to happen. Whereas a decade, two decades ago, when they sprayed apples in my community with a chemical, every mom in town was out picketing because we saw that as toxic to our kids. The toxicity of this has been so well documented, and we don't have people in the streets, you know. And, 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 it's a tra and it really is a tragedy. So we need a grassroots movement of people, you know, just refusing to tolerate it. I was going to ask you if you could speak a little bit to this um, challenge success, what you're doing on the North Shore tomorrow night. Okay, so. What does that mean? What is it? So, um, challenge success was started about five, six years ago. Um, it's basically school reform, parent education. Um, we take the best practices. It's exactly what I'm talking about tonight. The research, as, as is 
school didn't put that is overwhelming. How much sleep kids need, what engages them in learning, you know, what helps them become better students, better people. There's just like, you know, there's stuff there's no research on, there's stuff there's a lot of research on. So it's to bring into the schools uh, best practices, but it's not one size fits all. That's not the way school reform works. So we go into a school, we do pre-testing. What's your problem in your school? Some schools already have project-based learning, but they say their kids are cheating. So that's what we're looking at. It's sort of in five buckets. It's uh, scheduling, project-based learning, alternate assessment, climate of care, parent education. And those are kind of the buckets. We pre-test the schools, we come in for a couple of years, we post-test. And so far, our data is showing us that we can reduce stress without reducing GPA and college acceptance, which makes perfect sense, right? If you're not exhausted, you're going to perform better. Right? With let, you know, right now we have kids using Adderall as a study aid. Um, the, you know, this is a drug that's potentially has the potential to be fatal, and um, that's not how you learn. The reason, you know, yes, it can make people more attentive, but it can also kill them. And to have kids feeling that. You know, and I've talked to plenty of kids, what are you doing? Well, it's the only way I can keep up. It is a system that doesn't work. It is so broken. And um, I usually carry it around, I don't have it tonight, I carry around a letter, maybe it's my dad, from this kid who wrote to me, a teenager at a prestigious high school in uh, New York City, and he writes and he talks about how he goes to bed later than his parents, wakes up earlier than his parents. He's done everything right and it's still not good enough. And when I read the letter, people always say, oh, he's exhausted, he's this and that. And what I hear is, he's not a teenager. A teenager is supposed to say to something like this, screw this, I'm not doing this, this is crazy. <laughs> and he doesn't. And it's what I'm starting to see in kids, is a kind of compliance at the exact time when you're looking for kids not to be compliant. And that's part of the development of adolescent, and it's very scary. Hi. Um, I have three young children, yeah. age six, four, and one. And about three years ago, looking for a preschool, we stumbled upon Montessori. Uh -huh. And for so many reasons, we feel like we've hit the jackpot. Everything from the, you know, focusing on sensory development in the preschool to really working on educating the whole child in terms of social skills and, you know, homework, no grades, very little testing. Right. And, um, I went to public school, always intended for my kids to go to public school. And now I really feel, you know, like this makes so much sense for so many reasons. Why aren't more people talking about this? Why doesn't this get more attention? And when you talk to other experts in the field, do you ever hear this come up as an idea of perhaps, a, you know, sort of a more of a model for the public school? System to move towards? Sure. So um, I consult Montessori. I love the Montessori schools. And this guy mentioned when I said I called this guy, and he told me he needed two good things, and I said he made a lot of money. And so his kids went to Montessori school, which you know there is no high school or junior high school. That's what he built in um, in Marin County. Uh, for, They're building for, one here in Evanston. Too. There is one here. They're building one in They're Evanston. One. Yeah. 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 I mean. You know, people, people know about these things. People know the advantages of these kinds of schools. They're expensive. Um, they need different kinds of facilities. Montessori is about space. You know, it's, you can't just take the public school and throw the kids into it. Um, and I think that you still have a substantial number of people who will say it's not rigorous. What are they doing? They're playing. Um, it's not rigorous enough, and, it, you know, my kid will not, not do well. Forgetting that the founders of Google um, and Jay-Z, I just met that also, but so much <laughs> So, you know, um, some incredibly creative people. But part, I think part of the problem, frankly, in education is we're very fragmented. Um, so, like, I have challenges. There are programs everywhere. They really need to be synthesized. And um, I'm friendly with Diane Feinstein back in San Francisco. Go. And she has said, do not look for the government to do it. It's not going to happen because of the budget and all that kind of stuff. So I actually think it may happen through the business community. I'm not sure, but 
in a sense, they have the most to lose. They're the ones that are saying, we can't hire these kids. They don't know how to take care of themselves. Um, so at least in Silicon Valley, by the way, where almost all of those young Turks kids go to Montessori schools, um, I think there's some attempt to start synthesizing some of this. But I think that's a big problem. You know, everybody's got their own little, it's like academia, you know, their own turf, and it really needs to be a more homogenous thing. Okay, I'm going to take one more question, okay. and then I'll. Yes, yeah. right here. Uh, back, taking off of that, but back to the AP classes, you know, you say we need to come together as parents, and, you know, you need to have a social movement. Well, you know, I don't really buy that because all the scientists, you, and the psychologists, and professors, and everybody who are smarter than all of us said this is what we should be doing. And so the parents are as well and say, okay, this is what we should be doing. But isn't it up to the school districts to take this information and knowledge and science and say, we need to make a change? And it's the school districts that have to, are they not willing to go out beyond their little comfortable space because the next school district won't or because that one won't? I know personally, I have written many letters to I'm in District 200, next one over, very good school district, written letters to the, to, the, to the heads. Why are we not changing? You get lots of people asking these questions. If the school district is not willing to say, it's time to stop, it's raised to no aside several years ago, the, the science is out there, but the school districts are not willing to make the changes. I'm sorry, did I, did I just hear you? Did you say people, smarter people than us are saying it's supposed to be the way it is? No, we, the, the general audience and the parents, we only learn because we read the scientific studies, we listen to you, we, listen, we watch Race to Nowhere, right. and we go, yeah, that all sounds like a good idea. Right. Yet we go to the school districts and say, why aren't you hearing it? Why aren't you doing any changes? And they aren't. Okay, so um, if you're Slowly, that leaves it in your house, right? I mean, that's the reality. So, what do you do? Throw your hands up and say, "There's nothing I can do," or do you try to protect your kids? I mean, I, I, when I use the word courage, I mean it really, really seriously. To, to tell a kid they can't take another AP course, to tell a kid they have to stop their homework, that they have to go to bed. I mean, those are really hard things to do, and I think one of the things. You know, it's why I wrote this book, because it takes a look at how aligned we are. I can't do anything at your school district. Your school district knows all this stuff better than anybody, right? It's their profession. They know it. So the private schools are afraid that if they do some of this, then there's going to be an issue of the people are going to leave and go to the place where they think there's more rigor. I think that the parents... I, 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 don't, I can't separate them. I can't say it's just the school district or it's just the parents. I still think that they, it, you know, you still have, at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to your child. As hard as, you know, I wish I had a better answer for you, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own child in a way that nobody else is. Um, I mean, you talked about how you carry it around. I'm over here now. Where? Back here. Over here. That's it. I know you're not in a spatial relationship, but I'm back in front. Um, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Where are you? You know, this is something we could talk about for weeks and weeks. And someone talked about a systemic problem. We do hear it from the colleges. And I know that, you know, I'm the last person to be defending this, and I'm not going to. But, and then when I bring back this message that I always do. You can see, I'm responsible for the lineup. You can see who I'm bringing in. Um, but, you know, the school would say, we don't want your child taking five APs. Um, and I've been in situations, on the other hand, where I have parents who've said, I want to see, I pay my taxes, and we all do. I want to see that my child, that my school, child's school is ranked as high as it can possibly be. And that ranking nowadays is based on the number of students who are taking APs. I also know that the rigor has to, you know, we needed to make some changes at the lower levels, but to get back to what you said about schools need to hear from parents, absolutely. I hear, to me, your book is my Bible. And, and when I get crazed about my society and my, and my village and get caught up, I refer back to that and it brings me back to what, you know, I listen I think about what you said, and it empowers me to, to know that I have to stay on the track that benefits my child in spite of everything, but I totally agree with you. It starts with parents. 
parents getting getting angry enough to, to, to make a change. We could sit here all night, couldn't we? Thank you so much.